Right, thank you very much, and uh, a little bit too loud. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this fascinating meeting. And indeed, I want to tell you about uh, how to count one photon and get a result of a thousand. See if I can figure out how to advance the slides. There we are. So the main topic here really has to do with giant optical nonlinearities. I'll try to motivate that a little bit experimentally, talk about why we're interested, and tell you about the nonlinear phase shift that we can observe driven by a single photon. And in fact, the question of what I mean by a single photon, you'll see, will prove to be a little bit subtle. There was a surprise in it for us. I hope there'll be some surprises for you. And then we'll talk about amplification using Aharonov's ideas of weak value of the phase shift due to that single photon. I'll talk a little about practical issues that have been controversial about the signal to noise ratio. After all of that, there are just a few other things that I thought I would tell you about different topics in our lab. For dessert, I wanted to tell you about progress towards our cold atom tunneling experiments, where we're aiming at uh, measuring the tunneling time. And then I had planned a little digestif, but I, I read the information about the center, and I discovered that uh, alcohol is forbidden on campus. So I thought maybe instead, oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Instead, I would provide an appetizer, and maybe we will skip the digestif. Honestly, it's because this meeting turns out to be much more about foundational issues in quantum mechanics than I'd anticipated. And when I looked back at my talk, it seemed almost a little too practical, which is the opposite of what most audiences tell me about my talks. So I wanted to introduce a little more about foundations and give more of an introduction to weak measurement and to what it means to study the measurement disturbance. So before I go any further, let me give credit to the people who've really been doing this work in my lab. Uh, we have two main groups an entangled photons team and an ultra-cold atoms team, and a newer team that works on their interface looking at these nonlinear optical issues. Uh, the experiments I really want to focus on today were started by Amir Feyespur, Greg Mahovsky, and Mateen Halaji, and have since been picked up by Josiah Sinclair. The ultra... I don't think that was me. Uh, the ultra-cold atoms work has been going on for a number of years, but the recent material is due to uh, Shiraz Potnis and Ramon Ramos, most recently David Spearings. And some of our optics work uh, from the past was Dylan Mahler and Lee Rosema picked up by Hugo Ferretti and Edwin Pham. So let me begin with a question about quantum archaeology. So I know that many of you are thinking about different issues in the foundations of quantum mechanics, I want to calibrate and just see what your intuitions are about the following simple problem. So I don't know if you all know this game. I grew up in New York. We used to spend our time on the street corner trying to cheat unwitting tourists out of their money. And we would do it in the following way. We'd have three shells, and we'd put a $20 bill under one of the three shells, and the tourist is supposed to guess which shell. And of course, they never can. So I don't want to cheat you. You know, We're all quantum mechanicists here. I want to be fair. I'm going to give you some information. I'm going to put the bill not in one of these three boxes, but in a superposition, boxes A and B. I'll put it in A plus B over root 2. And we all know that's not enough information for you to tell with certainty which box the bill is under. So I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you that after I look for the bill, I'm going to look for it in a different superposition, B plus C over root 2. And I guarantee that I'm going to find it there. The question I have for you is, after I prepared it and before I found it, where was the bill? What's the probability that it's in box A? Can someone? That's exactly how I like this question to turn out. I ask this question of physics audiences and I ask it of non-physics audiences. The non-physics audiences always get it right. So I think there's something wrong with the way we teach ourselves quantum mechanics that people not educated in quantum mechanics know the right answer, and you and I have trouble with it. Let me replace the uh, plus signs here by the word or. No one has any trouble now, right? If I tell you I'm going to put it in A or B, and I promise I'm going to find it in B or C, you know perfectly well that it must be in box B. And the problem is we're not sure to what extent saying the cat is alive plus dead is the same as saying the cat is alive or dead. We know they're not exactly the same. But it turns out in this way they are the same. So there are conclusions that you can make from observations at the present time. 
And this is what people keep warning us not to do. Right? We're told that after the photon lands on the screen, you can't ask which slit it went through because that's not what you measure. All you have is the wave function. It propagates forward in time. And yet in real life and in science, we use present day observations to draw inferences about the past. Even in quantum mechanics, we can do that. We may not be able to extract complete trajectories, but we should be able to use all the information at hand. Right? I go into my lab at you know, 6 p.m. I see numbers on dials. And I conclude something about the experiments that my students were running during the day. Right? We all know that you can reason this way. So this is the idea of uh, what's often known as weak measurement. But I think if you really want to focus on this fundamental aspect, we shouldn't have named it that. We should call it conditional measurement. That's really what it's about. It's about conditional probabilities. What can I say about what a system is doing based on post-selection, based on final observations? So here's the original scheme due to Ahon of Albert and Weidmann in 1988. Imagine preparing a particle in some initial state, finding it later in some final state, and being curious what it was doing in between. In other words, imagining measuring something, some observable A, after the preparation and before the post-selection. How would we predict the value of A? Does it depend on I, the initial state, F, the final state, or perhaps equally on both? The way we're normally trained, of course, we start with I, we propagate forward in time, we measure A, and then Bohr tells us that something magical happens when the measurement occurs. Don't think about where we started anymore, all is forgiven, and we propagate only forward in time. However, the Schrodinger equation itself is completely time reversible. So Ahonov's idea was that there's no reason you couldn't start with F, propagate backwards, and draw conclusions about A that way. Now what most people would say is, when you do this measurement, you collapse the state. And that destroys the time reversibility. And that's something we need to think about more carefully. The way that they chose to do it in this particular paper was to imagine measuring A weakly. In other words, not letting the system interact very strongly with the measuring device. And in that way, no collapse occurs. The system is not greatly destroyed. And because of that little disturbance, you can ask, how does it continue to evolve after the measurement? Mathematically, this is what they had in mind. This is the standard quantum picture of measurement originally due to von Neumann. We allow a system to interact with some measuring device, which I'll call a pointer. And in von Neumann's picture, the pointer, although it was quantum mechanical, had to have a very low uncertainty. You want to measure something well, you want to know where the needle is pointing. So you put it in a very narrow Gaussian. And then we're going to let it couple to the system, to this observable A, through a Hamiltonian that will displace it by an amount proportional to A. All right, that just means that the Hamiltonian should be proportional to the pointer momentum because that generates translations of the pointer. If the system was in a superposition of many different states, that moves the pointer to a superposition of many different states, except correlated with the system position. So it entangles the system and the pointer. And it is that entanglement when you trace over one subsystem that gives us what we call decoherence. That's really what we call collapse in this kind of a theory. Another way of thinking about it is that I've localized the pointer very well. I've given it a very small position uncertainty. Due to the Heisenberg relationship, that means it must have a huge momentum uncertainty. Well, you notice its momentum shows up in this Hamiltonian. Suppose you're the system particle. All you know about is this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian has a large random number in it. Right? It looks like noise. So the reason that the system ends up disturbed and there is what Bohr would have called a, an uncontrollable and irreversible disturbance, is because you put a random number in the Hamiltonian. You put an uncertain momentum. We could get around that. We could begin with a pointer in a state that's very delocalized. But then its momentum could be very well defined, and there's no noise in this Hamiltonian. Or in terms of the coupling, what happens if the shifts due to the interaction are small compared to the position uncertainty? Then what Ahonoff and his colleagues showed is that instead of ending up with this entangled state of the system and pointer, to first order, you end up with an unperturbed system and a pointer that simply shifts its Gaussian by the expectation value. On a given trial, you wouldn't be able to tell whether this pointer had shifted or not. But if you repeat the experiment over and over again, which is what we always do, and you establish where the peak is, you would find that it had shifted by that expectation value. So you could measure the expectation value of A without disturbing the particle significance. That's what we mean by a weak measurement. 
Now, the thing that's interesting to me is the fact that since we haven't disturbed the particle, we can let it continue evolving and do some later post-selection. Here's a cartoon of that. Imagine this pointer, this red arrow with a large uncertainty, coupled to some wave function indicated in green over here. The two interact for a while. But now, before I look at the pointer, I do some other measurement, some strong measurement on that wave function. I say, I'm interested in this green peak, not this red peak over there. If I find the green peak, green light goes off. Red peak, red light goes off. And I will only look at the pointer when the post-selection succeeds. So I'm now going to ask, what happened to the pointer when I had a particle prepared in this state that I later found in that state? And I'll get some random result on each occasion. But if I build up statistics, I'll get a distribution of final pointer position. And at the end, that histogram will have a peak somewhere. And the question was, where is that peak? What is the average shift on a pointer if you look only at this subset of the total events? And this is the formula that they found. This is called the weak value because of the weak measurement. And you see that it's related in structure to an expectation value. A is sandwiched between two states. But now they're the initial and final state. So this depends equally, almost symmetrically, on the preparation and the post-selection. And it has to be normalized by the overlap, which is what gives rise to a lot of the odd features of weak values. But this has a lot of beautiful mathematical properties that make it an interesting thing, to me at least, to study in terms of what it teaches us about the underlying physical reality. And I'd be happy to discuss those with people later. I, I won't go into them right now. Now, I admit that this remains controversial. A lot of people say that's not what a measurement is. And that disturbs me because to me that means they're reading some textbook that was based on a theory developed in 1926 and saying, if you're not doing what that textbook told me is ideal, then you're not doing a measurement. And I think that's backwards. I think what happens in physics is we learn how to build things that measure things. You saw galvanometer yesterday already. And then we come up with a theory to describe what they're doing and what they're measuring. And if we then idealize the theory, leave out the details of the device, and say anything other than what matches my textbook is wrong, we're forgetting the goal of theory, which is to model what happens in the real world. All right? So if you do a measurement, if you let this device interact with the system, and you look at it on certain particular occasions, it does something, we should have a theory that can describe what it does. Now, there are people who say that what's wrong here is the fact that we're um, averaging over many, many measurements. This is a person who's never taken a laboratory course. I think you all remember that when you do an experiment, you average many, many measurements to get the noise down. There are very few experiments in physics where people publish a PRL saying, I turned on my device, I looked at the ammeter, and it said four. Right? The reason that it takes years to do an experiment at CERN is they average billions and billions of results. This is what we all do. So that's not a valid objection to weak measurement as opposed to any other measurement. It's what we do all the time. So let me talk about one of the applications of weak measurement that we did a while ago that I think also just gives us a reason to think about the weakness of measurement. Let's talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Any precise measurement of position is guaranteed to disturb momentum by an amount at least equal to h bar on p delta x. All right, so uh, that's a familiar statement. And for years when I was teaching quantum mechanics, I would tell my students, you've all heard this, and yes, yes, that's a true statement. But that's a true statement about measurement, and that's not the deep statement. It's much more interesting to recognize that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is telling us about all the information that can possibly be present in the quantum state. Any state in which x is determined precisely already has this intrinsic uncertainty. It's not just that my measurement disturbs the system. It's that the state does not know x and p. That's what's really interesting. Well, I still believe that, but after this uh, work I'm about to tell you about, I've realized that my initial statement is not even true. That it is not correct that a precise measurement of x is guaranteed to lead to that disturbance. So let me give you a hand-waving picture for this. Uh, there are better, more mathematical pictures, but this one I think is simple to understand. Imagine the wave function of some particle that is prepared so that at a certain time it has compact support. It's zero outside of these two dots. Only exists in this certain finite region. Now that already has a large uncertainty in momentum. Let me try to measure its position and see whether or not I disturb it. Let me do an approximate measure of position. How might I do that? 
Well, I might send it through a slit with a finite width. If it gets through the slit, I know that it was in, within that region. That's one way to approximately measure its position. But suppose that the slit is wider than the support of the wave function. This wave function never even sees the walls of the slit. Well, in some sense, there's no way I could have disturbed the particle at all in this case. And yet I've made a measurement of position. So I've already contradicted this familiar measurement uh, disturbance relation that we know about. And the way I would describe that is to say that, yes, since I now know the position to this uncertainty, the final momentum must be uncertain. But I didn't need to disturb it to get that uncertainty. I measured something that was already known. It already had that definite position. So it already had that uncertainty and momentum. So the real logic behind the familiar Heisenberg disturbance relationship would just be if there were no momentum uncertainty to begin with, can I measure the position? Yeah, I need to create momentum uncertainty, so I must disturb it. But if the momentum uncertainty is already there, it turns out that's not necessary. So there have been a number of uh, theoretical works on that that began with Masa Norizawa, who proved that although Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for the variances is still correct, we're not taking any issue with that, we've all proved it in our quantum mechanics class, if you reinterpret that as having to do with measurement precision and disturbance to the system, the way we like to talk about it, that's false. There are a few more terms in the inequality. In addition to this epsilon eta, the disturbance precision product, there are two more positive definite terms on the left, which means that you can satisfy Ozawa's proven inequality while violating Heisenberg. And since then, there are a few more even tight inequalities. But this is where it all started. The problem about verifying this is you have to measure the disturbance due to a measurement, which means before I measure position, I need to know what the momentum is and then measure what the momentum is again afterwards. But if I knew what the momentum was, that would change the state, which would change the expectation value of this commutator on the right. So for a long time, it looked like there was no way to experimentally test this idea until London Wiseman proposed doing it with weak measurements. And uh, Ozawa himself had an alternate proposal that's more like doing tomography that was carried out by uh, Earhart. The weak measurement picture is pretty simple, though. Here is our von Neumann measurement of A with some variable strength. Wave function comes in, interacts with the pointer. Pointer shifts. Wave function gets disturbed. And let's measure the precision and measure the disturbance. So let's define the disturbance to B reasonably as the RMS difference between the value of B before and after the measurement. We can do a weak measurement of B beforehand. Measure B strongly afterwards. Look at the difference. That tells us how much we've disturbed it. Statistics do it. We can also describe the precision of A as the RMS difference between the value of A of the system before and the value that we read out on the probe down here. That's how precise the probe is. So we could do a weak measurement of A over here and compare it with that and thereby get the precision. So this is what our experiment looked like. This is the quantum circuit picture using some teleportation. This is what it looked like in the lab. I don't really want to go into the details of the implementation, but I'll show you the results. As we varied the measurement strength, we found that the precision of the measurement went down, by which I mean it got better and better, more precise. But the disturbance did indeed go up, as you expect. But when we multiply those two things, we find them down here well below the Heisenberg bound. So although there is a disturbance and it increases with precision, it can be less than h bar on two. If you add Ozawa's other terms, it's well above the bound. So there is disturbance due to measurements, but it is not bounded as simply as you might expect. So that was the introduction. Now let me get to our main course, counting one photon and getting a result of 1,000. And as I said, the experimental background here is trying to implement giant optical nonlinearities, also known as weak optical nonlinearities for historical reasons. Here's the practical motivation. I want to be able to do quantum nonlinear optics. I want to be able to see one photon interact with another one photon flip a switch that determines whether or not a second photon gets transferred. This would be a new frontier in optical physics. And at the same time, this is what you need in order to make a quantum logic game. So there have been a few proposals. Obviously, if you had pi phase shifts between two photons, you'd be able to make a controlled phase gate immediately. Typical optical nonlinearities are about a billion or 10 billion times too weak to do that. So there are a few proposals. 
One of them has to do with Rydberg atoms, where it now looks like we really can generate those pi nonlinearities. There's beautiful work by Lukin and Vuletic, by Rampa, and by others doing that. And a lot of groups, including my own, are now jumping on that bandwagon. But before that was working, there was a clever proposal due to Monroe, Nomoto, and Spiller, and some of their collaborators as well, that suggested that even with what they called weak nonlinearities, you could get deterministic quantum computation. And their idea was the following. Suppose my nonlinearity cannot write a pi phase shift, but writes a phase shift of something very small, perhaps a milliradian. That milliradian, of course, is still a million times what we typically had in the lab. That's why the theorists call these weak nonlinearities, and the experimentalists still call them giant nonlinearities. They're both at the same time. Now, I can't measure a milliradian phase shift on one photon. But if you give me a coherent state with more than a million photons, the phase noise goes as 1 over root n. I could measure that milliradian phase shift. So they said, let your qubit photon interact, not with another photon, but with a coherent state. That coherent state picks up a potentially measurable phase shift. But now the same coherent state could interact with a second qubit in such a way that when I look at its phase, I learn not about the photon number here, but perhaps the sum of these two photon numbers or their difference, something that then entangles those two qubits. And they showed that by doing the right post-selection and feed-forward, they could make this into a deterministic system for quantum models. So the basic idea is, can you build a system that is capable of resolving the phase shift due to a single photon? Doesn't matter how small it is. I'd be happy with a nanoradian if you could give me a system that could measure that nanoradian. We don't have that. So this is what we were aiming towards. Can we see the phase shift due to just one photon? Can we take some Kerr medium, some cross phase shift medium, send a single photon through it, and have a probe beam pick up a phase shift that we could then measure on some sort of an interferometer? That's the idea. So let me tell you a little about how atomic physicists like to think of cross phase modulation, the way one photon can put a phase shift on a second photon. If we have a two-level system, the way we always think of resonances in atomic physics, then the phase shift seen by a probe has to do with the refractive index, which goes through this dispersive profile as you go through resonance. What if there's a third level in this system, and we have a signal pulse, maybe a single photon, that tries to couple these two levels, that is off resonance, so it doesn't get absorbed. Well, it still has fields that are close to resonance, and those electric fields shift the energy level. We get what we call an AC start shift, causes these two levels to repel. And suddenly, the probe no longer thinks it's on resonance. It sees itself detuned a little bit from resonance, which means it sees a different index of refraction, which means it picks up a different phase. And the more intense this signal pulse is, the bigger this shift, the bigger this change in detuning, and the bigger that phase shift. So the second beam will pick up a phase shift proportional to the intensity of the first beam. Let's come back. You get to see the movie again. There we are. All right. Now, that's a nice effect. It was proposed about 20 years ago by Yamamoglu that you could enhance this using something called electromagnetically induced transparency. And I won't go into the, the background of this scheme. It involves adding yet one more level, so we now have four atomic levels. There's a strong coupling beam here, which just acts as a kind of catalyst. The interesting thing is that this absorption profile, this Lorentzian dashed line we're used to seeing, gets modified by the presence of the coupling beam. And you can write a narrow notch right in the middle, making the medium transparent where the resonance used to be. When you write that narrow feature in the absorption, the imaginary part of the index, it also writes a narrow feature in the real part of the index, shown here in the solid line, which means you can make a very large slope here by making a very narrow feature. And since that slope is what tells us how sensitive the probe phase is to the AC start shift, to the presence of the other photon, that enhances the nonlinearity. If you go to a very narrow window, we'll get a very large cross phase shift. Now, what else do we need? The phase shift is also proportional to the intensity. So we'd like to turn up our signal beam. Except my goal here is to have a signal beam with just one photon. So I know the energy. The energy is h bar omega. I can focus it down to get a higher intensity. And we focus it as tightly as we can. But there's a limit of a few wavelengths. So the only other thing we can do is make it shorter in time. That's a way to make a larger intensity. So the broadband signal pulse, large in time, 
will produce a large cross spatial. We were talking about this years ago when Tillman Fowl was on sabbatical in Toronto. And he argued that our idea was crazy because we were going to have a narrow transparency window, maybe 100 kilohertz. And yet we were trying to use single photons that were tuned to the rubidium line width, which is about 7 megahertz. What's the use of having a narrow 100 kilohertz window if your photons are 7 megahertz apart? Well, that's no problem, I told him. What we're going to do is we're going to put the broadband signal on this other transition on the right where there is no transparency window, but we're still transparent because we're off resonance. And we'll use a narrowband probe inside the window over here. And although that sounded all right at first, intuitively he told me, look, if you've got an EIT bandwidth of 100 kilohertz and you're relying on that, somehow you have a system whose response time is 1 over 100 kilohertz, whatever that is, something on the order of 10 microseconds. And your pulses, which were 100 nanoseconds to make these intense single photons, is much shorter than the response time of the medium. It's just not going to get a big bump in the area. And it turns out there was some experimental work due to John Howell's group that uh, supported that idea, suggested that EIT would be too slow to work on these short pulses. However, we thought about it and we realized that work was a little too simplistic. We did both the theory and the experiment published this past year that showed the following results. This is experimental data as we change the width of the EIT window. We have a short pulse, about 40 nanoseconds here, I think, around uh, T equals 1, where this plot is drawn. And we're looking at the phase shift on the probe as a function of time. We'll start with this black curve. You see that we get a little pulse in phase. As we narrow the EIT window, we move up to this next curve. We get a much larger phase shift. And as we keep making the EIT window narrower, this peak phase shift stops growing. The effect saturates when we make the EIT window narrower than the spectrum of the signal, just as John Howell's group has shown. On the other hand, it doesn't get any smaller. We still get the same peak phase shift. We still get it very early. And then the narrower the EIT window, the longer it lasts. So the slow response, I think, is a good thing. It's much easier to see this phase shift if it lasts a long time than if it lasts a very short time and goes away. So although the advantage is not in the size of the N2, the thing you'd normally think about, there is still an advantage for measuring the phase shift. Depends on your resources. It's something else we could argue about later. But it certainly doesn't hurt. So now let's use that. Let me show you how we used that a few years ago to observe the nonlinear effect of a single photon. We trap rubidium-85, cool it down in a molasses. We need this electromagnetically induced transparency coupling beam. It's kind of a catalyst for the experiment. It comes in from the side, which has a lot of problems, but technically that was necessary for us at the time. And then we focus two telescopes on top of each other, focus down to about 15 microns on the atoms, one probe pulse that goes through the atoms to measure a phase shift, and one signal pulse that goes through the other way and could have just a single photon. Originally, we designed a source of single photons tuned to rubidium. That source, at best, put out about 100 photons per second. And at our current phase shifts, that just wasn't enough signal to do anything. So we had to go to plan B, and we ended up using very weak coherent states from an attenuated laser to do this experiment. And here's what we found as we turn down the intensity of our laser from maybe 10 to the 5 photons per pulse, where we begin to saturate the atoms, all the way down to a single photon per pulse on average, we still see the phase shift. We measure about a 15 microradian phase shift. Not the large phase shift that I wanted. We're still working on that. But we're able to measure that for the first time in free space for pulses that only have about a single photon on average. We needed to average millions of times to do that. This isn't working yet at the single shot level. I want to be clear about that. But we're able to see that phase shift. Now, of course, I don't want to see it for a Poisson distribution of photon number. I wanted to see it for a true single photon. And it occurred to us there's a way to do that. So here's the phase shift when we have five photons. Here's the phase shift when we have two photons, again, in a coherent state. And we were about to go to half a photon. We thought, what if we went to, sorry, we were about to go to one photon. We thought, what if we went to half a photon? What is a coherent state with one half a photon? The answer is there's no such thing as half a photon. You have a state that, roughly speaking, has vacuum 50% of the time and a single photon 50% of the time. Could we tell which was which? Well, remember, the medium is basically transparent. So what we can do is let that signal photon or signal coherent state go through the atoms 
wait until it hits an avalanche photodiode, and see if it clicks or not. And we find, sure enough, when it clicks, we see a phase shift. And when it doesn't click, we don't see a phase shift. Now we began thinking more about that. How much can you really say this detector is not 100% efficient? Even if it doesn't click, there might be a photon. Uh, that one we don't care about yet. So here is the theoretical result. What we found is if you begin with a coherent state with some average photon number, and you have an inefficient detector, and you ask, what is my best estimate of the photon number after the detector either fires or doesn't fire? You can use Bayesian statistics to do this. You get the right answer. If you don't trust statistics, you can do the quantum optical calculation. It takes much longer. It gives you the same answer. And the answer is, if it doesn't click, you should revise your estimate down by a factor of 1 minus eta. If eta, the efficiency, is 100%, then when it doesn't click, you say there weren't any photons. If the detection efficiency was only 10%, then on average, you revise your estimate by 10%. But if the detector does click, what do you do? Turns out you add almost exactly one photon. No matter what the efficiency of the, the uh, detector was, every time it clicks, that click corresponds to one new photon. And that surprised us at first. It came out of the math. And then I realized it's actually completely logical. How do quantum optics people model inefficient detectors? Well, you begin by imagining a perfectly efficient detector. And then you say maybe 90% of the photons missed the detector. I have a beam splitter with transmissivity of eta, reflectivity of 1 minus eta. And after that beam splitter, I hit 100% efficient detector. That's the quantum optical model of an inefficient detector. So let's think about what happens with an incident coherent state. It breaks into a product state of two different coherent states at the output. What does it mean physically for something to be a product state? It means that there is no new information you can gain about one system by conducting a measurement on the other system, because there are no correlations. So whether or not this detector fires, I learn nothing about this state in the other arm. The average photon number in this arm is alpha squared, my incident photon number, times 1 minus eta. And that's never going to change. On the other hand, in this arm, when I look at the detector, I either see 0 photon or 1 photon. So if I see 0, my estimate of the total number is just 1 minus eta times alpha squared. And if I see 1, it's 1 minus eta times alpha squared plus 1. And that's why the number goes up. That detector firing is an individual photon. So we repeated that conditioning for all of these values. The red points are what happens if we measure the phase shift when the detector does not fire. The blue points are what happens if we measure the phase shift when the detector does fire. And we see an additional phase shift of about 15 microradians every time the detector fires. So even though we didn't have our heralded single photon, we're seeing a true quantum effect here. We're seeing the phase shift due to a quantum occurrence, due to the click of the detector. Even if we had not been able to calibrate our fields at all, had no idea how much energy a single photon had, this would show us the nonlinearity due to that single photon. So in the end, even though this was our plan B, I thought this was much more interesting than what we originally wanted to do. I like this better now than the heralded single photon. And we're experimentalists. We check for systematics. There aren't any. You should believe us. Now let's come back to this quantum archaeology question. If I've determined that there was one photon that got to the detector, can I ask what it was doing beforehand? And in particular, can I make it have a larger effect by doing so? So here's what I mean by that. I showed you this formula before. I didn't show you the title of the original paper where it was proposed. This paper was not called Weak Measurement or a proposal to do post-selective quantum measurements. It was called how the result of a measurement of a component of the spin of a spin one-half particle can turn out to be 100. So remember the denominator in that weak value expression. That's the overlap between the final and initial states. If those states are nearly orthogonal, the denominator becomes very small. And this result can be arbitrarily large. It can be well outside the eigenvalue spectrum of A, as in the example of that title. And yet, experimentally, this is the prediction for how much the pointer would shift by. There's never any individual event where you say that spin had S sub Z equal to 100. Because all you can measure in weak measurements is an average. The uncertainty in each individual measurement is too large. What you find, however, is that the peak shifts by something that corresponds to 100. So it was suggested that this might be a way to amplify small effects. 
do the right post selection and get a much larger shift on the pointer. This was done early on by Owner Hostin and Paul Kuyat, who measured the spin hall effect for light for the first time by using this, and then more quantitatively by John Howell's group, who really investigated the signal to noise issue. But I want to show you how the result of the measurement of the number of one photon can be, oh, I lost a, uh, I lost a zero there, can be a thousand. So here's our interaction. We're going to think of this as our von Neumann measurement. The probe is our pointer. It's interacting with photons in this mode B. But let us not prepare our single photon in mode B. Let's prepare it in some superposition, A minus B over root 2. In other words, let's build an interferometer. Now let's post-select the photon on a nearly orthogonal state, Ra plus Tb, where R and T are almost 1 over root 2, but not exactly. So these are almost orthogonal. What does that mean experimentally? It means combine these two at another beam splitter and look for a port where there are almost no photons. Some photons, but not that many. And trigger every time that fires. Well, if we do that and we ask, what phase shift should we see on the probe? The answer is given by the weak value. The weak value is the NB operator, number of photons in mode B, sandwiched between I and F. That just gives T over root 2 over t minus r over root 2, this imbalance in the interferometer that can be arbitrarily small. We call it delta. So this number goes as 1 over 2 delta. It can be arbitrarily large, and it, that's true even if you have only a single signal photon. So a photon in the hand is worth 1,000 in the bush, phase 2. And this is how the experiment was done. We again focus two beams onto the atoms, a probe and a signal. But now the signal contained two different polarizations. Those are going to be the two arms of our interferometer. And by using a sigma plus polarized probe and worrying a lot about all the Clefsch Gordon coefficients and all the levels in our rubidium atoms, we found a scheme where the interaction of a sigma plus signal, right hand circular polarized, was very strong and we could almost neglect the interaction of the sigma minus. So the probe is measuring almost the number of sigma plus photons. But we don't send in a sigma plus photon. We send in a horizontally polarized photon, a superposition of these two polarizations. And we post-select on, I don't know, an 80 degree polarized photon, something almost orthogonal to H, but not quite. And when this detector fires, we measure the phase shift. And as a function of delta, here's what we find. This is the single photon phase shift in this case, about 8 microradians. And as we turn delta down, we see an improvement by up to a factor of eight. We really see that a single post-selected photon can give you a phase shift eight times larger than the measured single photon phase shift. How you interpret that in terms of what it says about quantum reality? Was the photon number really eight, even though I know there was only one photon? I'm not sure. Mathematically, the way this gets resolved is that if we could do the measurement on the other arm, we would find the mean photon number in the other arm was minus seven. So the total photon number is still one. Obviously, people still argue about what all of that means. Is there any practical use to all of this? Uh, let me skip a few slides and say, we don't know. There are good reasons to doubt it. We have good reasons to support it. Many, many papers, you see some here, have argued yes and no. We're about to write another one. Uh, there are certain trivial cases where we know this helps. If you just have detector saturation, so you need to turn your source down anyway, much better to turn it down by post-selecting in an intelligent way and getting an amplification. But we also believe that if the noise has the right correlation properties, there are some advantages. Again, I'm happy to discuss this with you because it's still kind of a work in progress. But before I leave you, I just wanted to show you some movies because I think they're exciting. I'll skip that point also. This is our dessert, as promised. This is Alain Aspe playing with his dessert. That's a panacotta with some Bogolyubov modes. Um, this is something I've been interested in for over 20 years now, and I think we're finally getting to the point where we can do the experiment. We want to take particles and let them tunnel through a barrier and ask them to look at their watch when they get through the other side and tell us how long they spent in that barrier. And there are various ways to do that. The smartest ones, some of them due to Boudicca and Landauer, turn out to be examples of weak measurement. They were published before weak measurement was invented, so they didn't know that's what it was. But that's precisely what it is. And we think we can do this with cold atoms tunneling through an optical barrier. 
So here are movies just to show you where we are. This is a movie of our Dravidium 87 atoms that are trapped sitting on top of a sheet of light with gravity pulling down on them. And they sit there on that sheet of light and they spread out until they spill off the edges of the table. But a few of them should still be tunneling through the barrier here. And that's what we're looking for, the ones that tunnel through the barrier. In a more recent experiment, we took our barrier, we managed to make it about one micron across, and to really test how quantum mechanical it was, we converted it to a double barrier. So it should now behave like a fabry perot Here's what happens. This is a series of stills that forms a kind of movie, a wave packet incident from the right that hits a barrier. Some particles are transmitted, some are reflected, but look what happens right here in the middle. A little subset of the particles gets trapped inside our double barrier. And what we think is it's really acting like a fabry perot cavity for atom waves, where some narrow frequency band of our Bose condensate remains trapped here. Later results show it remains trapped for hundreds of milliseconds. We're still trying to figure out how to measure the coherence time, see just how narrow band those are. And we've instituted other techniques that should let us measure the amount of time the individual particle spends inside that tunnel barrier. So I think that'll be a really fundamental contribution of these measurements to asking questions about the history of a particle. Where was the tunneling particle before it got out? Now, as I said, I don't have time for the uh, digestif that's forbidden anyway. So let me just jump ahead, leave you with my summary, and thank you again for your attention. You. I think we uh, all learned how to measure a thousand photons just having a single photon. But are there any questions left? We have time for a couple, I suppose. I don't expect this a way around to violate the no cloning theorem where. Um, because you have this weak measurement, you can determine the state very precisely. Is this because you need to do it many times? That's right. You, you, you can't really determine a state very precisely in the weak measurement. If you're thinking about the weak value amplification, where we get this larger signal, what you're really doing is measuring a parameter. It's telling you how large is this per photon nonlinearity by giving you an effect that's eight times larger. So you're, it's for measuring a classical parameter, a coupling constant, and a as far as the weak measurements themselves, right, you always get much less information from a single system than you would with the strong measurement. You could repeat many different weak measurements, and in the end, you'd have the same trade-off. By the time you did enough to achieve what you would have with a strong measurement, you'd get the same disturbance. The nice thing is that you can do something else. You can instead do weak measurements on different non-commuting observables without each one interfering with each other. And that's what allows us to correlate different measurements, ask things like, what is the average momentum of particles at this position? Which sounds a little bit like tomography. And in a sense, that's what this gives us, complementary techniques for simultaneously characterizing different aspects of the quantum. So in the late 90s, there was also some work by Anandan on protective measurements. Uh, yes, that, that's, that's an outgrowth of, of this. It's of the weak measurements. For example, if the state that you're studying is also separated by a gap from the next state, you can do these measurements so gently that you could keep doing repeated measurements on the state and unlike what I said a moment ago, uh, not worry about any disturbance building up. So Anandan and Honov argued that that sort of defended the reality of the wave function. I could give you a hydrogen atom in the 1s state and you could measure psi at all sorts of different positions and reconstruct the entire wave function for a single electron. And the counter argument was that the only reason that that works is because you already know it's in one of these protected states, in an energy eigenstate. So I think it was Bill Unruh among the people who pointed out that what you've really demonstrated is that the Hamiltonian is real, that its eigenstate is real, not that a quantum state might generate. Okay, so let's uh, all go out and, well, cu cut the discussion here and uh, take it outside.